Oh, thank you very much. And let's all welcome Nader and Gaeta. I think it's his first, certainly his first time at the JQI seminar, though he's been a visitor here and collaborated with people here over the years. Uh, Nader was educated, uh, got his undergraduate education at the University of Tehran, PhD at Caltech, and he's presently the H. Nedwill Ramsey Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, affiliated with the Departments of Electrical and Systems Engineering, Bioengineering, Material Sciences, and Engineering in Physics and Astronomy. A very highly noted contributor to optical science and technology, uh, recipient of the Isaac Newton Medal of the Institute of Physics in 2020, same year the Max Born Award be, uh, given by the Deutsche Physikalische Gesellschaft and what is now called Optica, then the Optical Society of America, fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering and of you know all the relevant professional societies. Uh, SPIE gold medal. That's a long list, but I'd like to point out for it uh, for today's uh, recollection. Honorary doctorate from the National Technical University of Kharkiv Polytechnic Institute in 2017. This coming Wednesday, he'll be giving the 2022 Herman Anton House lecture at MIT and it's just a great pleasure to have him here. Uh, he's available for visits today and tomorrow morning. So please contact me if you have not done so yet. Thank you. Thank Welcome, Doc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Let me put this one here. Okay. Thank you very much for your kind and generous introduction. It's a pleasure and honor for me to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Charles, Alicia, Kartik for uh, the kind invitations to me to be here and uh, to have a chance to come and visit. I have many friends over here, Charles, uh, Steve Unlock, uh, Avik Dot, many other friends, and it's wonderful to be back here again. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is one of the areas of research activities in my group, uh, which relates to the topic of uh, near zero index optics. And I'm going to tell you what it, it is. Uh, but in general, in my group, we are interested in uh, exploring how materials particularly specially engineered materials known as metamaterials and metasurfaces can actually affect wave propagations. And this wave propagation could be in the microwave domain, could be optical domain, depending on the specific uh, type of application we have in mind. And particularly we would like to know what interesting unusual effects we can find for this type of interaction. So before I get into the main topic here, let me just for uh, sake of general introduction, I give you a few slides, like three, four slides of what metamaterials are. And after that, then we jump into specifically what we do, particularly with respect to this topic. So you all know, by the way, that light matter interaction is governed by the laws of electrodynamics, both classical electrodynamics, Maxwell's equation that we use every day, and the quantum electrodynamics and quantum optics. But in general, whenever we deal with such interaction, we would like to parameterize this interaction in terms of macroscopic parameters that you're all familiar with. Permittivity, permeability, conductivity, nonlinear susceptibility, chirality, and so on and so forth. Now, if we look at materials in nature, either from periodic tables or a combination of elements from periodic tables, we know that these material parameters I showed you in the previous slide have certain range of values. And of course, we use them to make many different things. But the concept of metamaterial material would allow us to actually combine this material in a very interesting way to come up with effective parameters that have values that goes outside this particular range of values. And the concept of metamaterials materials actually can be explained in this simple slide. Imagine that you have a host medium, and then you embed this host medium with many man-made inclusions. And then when electromagnetic waves comes over here and interact with them, they're gonna induce electric and or magnetic dipole moments in each of them, and those re-radiate. And for the observer sitting outside looking at this, you can actually have values for these effective parameters there. It's interesting, by the way, as a footnote, I should add that you can actually do this combination such that these effective parameters 
would have values that are very different than the values of each individual parameters of the constituents. And that makes it actually quite exciting as you will see some of the results that we're gonna talk about. Now, why is this interesting? Because you can actually have control over many parameters in this design. You can control the composition of this inclusion, in other words, made of metal, semiconductors, dielectrics. You can control the alignment and arrangement of this, in other words, whether you would put them in the periodic fashion or you would put them in the random location. You can actually, obviously, uh, take care of their density, how many of them per unit volume. Obviously, the host medium play a role. And last but not least, you can actually also design the shape of them. And particularly this last one is the one, by the way, in the last 20 some years have attracted a lot of attention because with the nanoscience and nanotechnology, you can actually make these elements that would be a fraction of the light wavelength. Now, over the rays, uh, in past two decades, there have been many groups looking at a variety of different forms of metamaterials. In fact, my good friend, Steve Anlog, did one of the pioneering work in the area of superconducting metamaterials that you see here. And then you can see, you know, some other groups, you know, have done work on different aspects of metamaterials. And by the way, this list is by no means exhaustive. I can show you pages and pages and pages of many, many groups all over the world have done the work. This is just some sample of that. In my group, by the way, currently we are working on a variety of different topics related to the light matter interactions. The list of some of them I should mention over here. Of course, there's no time to go through all of them over here. So what I do, I pick one topic, and I'm going to talk about that topic today. And that is the near zero index photonics. Before I get to that one, let me show you three slides of two other topics, by the way, that might be of interest to you. And if there are anybody in the audience interested to talk to me about those topics, which is not part of the talk today, I'd be more than happy to talk to you as well. One of the topics that the, uh, we have been recently uh, concentrating on that is the following questions. Can we actually design a material that can do mathematical operations for you as the wave goes through it? In particular, the question we pose is that, can we use a material that as you send the wave through it can actually solve equations? And indeed we have shown that that's the case. In fact, particularly we wanted to show that we can actually design a structure that can solve integral equation, fret home integral equation of the second kind with the general linear integral equation. Indeed, we did that and we designed this structure as you see over here. This is some computer simulation of how the wave interacts with these structures and we build it. And then we experimented on that in the microwave regime. And indeed we showed, and these are the combination of uh, experimental result with the theoretical result. We showed that when you change the input to this structure, what the output waves comes out with the solution to that integral equations there. Now the experiment we did was in the microwave. Currently we are working on bringing this concept into silicon photonics and to actually design something that with a few tens of uh, microns would be able to actually solve and do analog computations. That's not the subject of my talk today, but if there are any interests, I'd be happy to talk to you offline on that. Another topic that uh, we have been concentrating recently is that can we actually have a concept of metal material in four dimensions? Now, many of the topics in metal material works based on manipulation of the wave based on spatial inhomogeneity, how the permittivity varies with the space. Well, what if you actually also change the permittivity in time in addition or in place of changing it in space? In that case, that's what I call four dimensional metamaterial and we are looking at the various different topics. This is one example that we call it the temporal aiming, meaning that when the wave is actually propagates midstream, you can actually change the direction of propagation of that wave by changing the permittivity of the background. Another topic that we have been developing is the temporal analog of anti-reflection coating. Anti-reflection coating is a very well-known subject in optics. Here we showed that you can actually do it in time by actually changing permittivity in time in an analogous way that of course the typical anti-reflection coating would do. And another topic that we have been working on is what is the temporal equivalent of Brewster angle? Now we are all familiar with Brewster's angle by the way for dielectrics but we discovered actually there's a very interesting temporal analog to that as well. Again, this is not the topic of the talk today, 
But if there's any interest, I'd be happy to talk to you later. So let's come back to the talk, actually the main topic of the talk today. What is the near zero index optics? The question is what would happen if you design a material structure in which the index of refraction would be near zero? What interesting things you can get. So before I show you what that is and get into it, let me just show you actually an interesting computer simulation, kind of like a preview of coming attraction. What would happen if the index of refraction would be near zero? So imagine that you have a simple waveguide, a simple parallel plate waveguide made of metal and uh, PEC, perfect electric conductor, and inside is air, and you have a TEM mode propagating down this waveguide, simplest possible mode you can imagine. Now, what if I come over here and I cut this waveguide in half, put half of it one side of the room, put another half the other side of the room, and then try to connect these two halves by some arbitrary connection like this, completely arbitrary. Now, the only thing I'm, I'm assuming over here is this wall is still PEC. This wall is still PEC. And this boundary is normal to the direction of propagation. And for the sake of mathematical simplicity, let me assume that this is two dimensional structures. Everything is independent of the axis coming out of the screen. Now let's pose this question. What kind of material I should fill out that blob such that if an observer sits over here and an observer sits over there, those two observers would think that they are sitting here and here. In other words, that those observers would not know that there is such a blob there. Now you might say, well, Fabri Peru, uh, I mean, can do the same well, if, if you are the resonance. But in Fabri Peru, if you change the size of it, it will change frequency. Here, what I'm trying to say is this connection is completely arbitrary in size, in shape, and even in the angle of the waveguide. The answer to this question is that if I fill this region with a material with relative permittivity near zero, relative permeability near zero, I can achieve that. Why? Because if I can do that, the wavelength inside this material would be stretched, would be infinitely long, because index is near zero at the given frequency. And if I do that, then this size, although it could be being sizable, compared to that wavelength would be very small. So in that case, the phase at this point would be the same as the phase at this point. And these two observers sitting here and sitting there, they would not notice a difference. Towards the end of my talk, I'm going to show you that we did this and we did the experiment and we could do it. But if we could do it this, then you can do some other interesting things. For example, take a look at how the magnetic field look like in this structure. The wave is coming like this, the magnetic field over here. You notice the magnetic field also changing in time, obviously with the same frequency, but you notice the changes in unison. Why? Because the wavelength inside that region is infinitely extended. And you notice that the phase over here, oops. You notice that the phase uh, over here is the same as the phase over there. And these are the distribution of the electric field that you see there. Now, but this actually is even more interesting than you think, because you can put the two wave guys at any point you want, and you don't see any reflection. So essentially what I'm saying over here is this, that this region that has epsilon and mu near zero, even though physically sizable, from electromagnetic point of view is a point, is a point. In other words, these two waveguides, they feel they're at the same location. But it's even better than regular waveguide because regular waveguide, if you bend it, you're gonna get reflection. Here, you can actually do it. Here, you can actually do it 180 degrees and you get no reflections that you're over here. Okay, now with this background, let me take you back to about 17 years ago. Uh, before you go on, could I ask a question? Sure. Uh, this is Bill Phillips. Um, sure. One question that naturally arises here is how should I think about the propagation time? In other words, uh, it sort of sounds like what you've got is a very high, maybe a very high phase velocity. Presumably the group velocity isn't high. Could you just say a little bit about 
um, information transfer and speed of light and that sort of thing. Sure. Thank you very much for the question. In fact, I was going to discuss that a little bit later, but thank you for the question. Yes, here the phase velocity is very high. The group velocity is certainly less than velocity of light because this material has to be dispersive. So as a result, index of refraction to, to be designed to be near zero at the given frequency, it is the for continuous wave process, not for the transient scenario. For the transient scenario, clearly, of course, the information would go with the velocity less than velocity of light. So everything is okay over here. If you switch on your signal, your signal switch on would go obviously with the velocity less than velocity of light. But when the signal establishes with the CW or continuous wave, at that frequency for which you design this material to have index near zero, in that case, the phase velocity would be very high, but the group velocity is less than velocity of light. And because the size is finite, the energy and the information will go from left to the right, as we experimentally, have, of course, have shown. Uh, was that everything clear? Yeah, thanks. Sure, thank you. So back in 2005, uh, we, start, we asked this following questions, just simply a what if question. And it was no application in mind. We were just actually curious about this. What would happen if we have a structure like this, just like the waveguide I show you, the two waveguides, oops. And we connect this region in a very arbitrary shape. And if we fill this region with material with epsilon near zero. Now at that time, we were not thinking about mu near zero. We we're just thinking about epsilon near zero. Mu was one or relative mu was one. What interesting can happen? Now, what happened is if I showed you these two waveguides that I showed you a few minutes ago, and then I connect this thing like that, before I fill that region, you might say, okay, a wave is coming from here, that's good. What would happen to this wave when it hits this, you know, this, kind, this, this transition between the two waveguides? Well, you would expect that the good amount of energy would reflect back and the little thing will go inside. That's true. But then we said, what if we actually fill this region with the material with relative permittivity near zero? Before we started solving this problem, we had two intuitions in our head, which were completely opposite to each other. On the one hand, we were saying, because epsilon is near zero, index of refraction near zero, that means the phase is uniform inside the structure. That means the phase over here at this boundary should be the same as the phase over here which means that the electric field I have over here would have the same phase over there. And because the electric field is oscillating with frequency omega, then you have a radiation over here. And by conservation energy, reflection should be less. So that was one intuition. But another intuition was giving us the different things. We were saying, okay, if epsilon is near zero inside this material, square root of mu over epsilon, the intrinsic impedance of the wave is very high. Whereas over here in this region, which is air, that's not the case. So we would have a huge impedance mismatch over here. So in that case, if we have huge impedance mismatch, maybe less field gets in, even though it has uniform phase. So which one is it? Is it? So we decided to actually attack this problem to see which one of these actually turns out to be the case physically. And we got lucky because we were able to actually solve this problem exactly analytically for this case. And that's the formula you see over here. This formula is the reflection coefficient of the TEM mode that's coming from here and reflects back. And this expression is a reflection coefficient of that. Now, before I explain what these quantities are in that reflection coefficient, let me make sure something very clear. The structure that we are looking over here is two dimensional. It's everything is independent of the angle coming out of the screen. That's number one. The boundaries are all PEC, so they are impenetrable except for the port one over here and port two over here. And then uh, this region is completely arbitrary shape that you see over there. And this region that is, has a different you know, uh, color, that's the one that the relative permittivity is near zero. Now, so if I want this reflection coefficient to be zero, what do I need to do? I have to make sure the numerator is equal to zero. But the numerator has a real and imaginary part, as you can see. Let's take a look at this first part, A1 minus A2 should be equal to zero. A is this height of this waveguide. A2 is the height of that waveguide. That means these two heights should be the same. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Two waveguides with a similar height. 
But then I have to make sure that this imaginary term over here would be also equal to zero. And that's multiplication of three terms. If I make any one of them zero, I achieve my goal. So let's walk over that. So if I make K naught equal to zero, what is K naught? K naught is omega over C, velocity of light in vacuum. So it means if I put frequency equal to zero, I get zero reflection. But that's not interesting. That means I have a DC case, which means that if I have a battery over here, I get the same volt over here. Not interesting. The second possibility, if I can put mu sub R equal to zero, and mu sub R is the relative permeability of that region. Now, at that time, we didn't want to touch mu sub R equal to zero. Right now, we are doing it, but not at that time. Because if we wanted to put mu R zero, that means that we have an impedance match, and that would be an interesting possibility there. We didn't do it. But then we had only one other possibility to make that reflection equal to zero, and that's A sub D. But what is A sub D? A sub D is this cross-sectional area that you see over here of this region. So it means what? It means if I make A sub D smaller and smaller and smaller, I make the reflection coefficient smaller. So this was very counterintuitive to us. Let me repeat that again, which means if I make A1 and A2 fixed equal to each other, but I make A sub D smaller and smaller and smaller, basically almost choke this waveguide, the wave actually tunnels through this better. So this was very counterintuitive for us. We did a lot of tests. We did a lot of computer simulation. Later on, we did the experiment, which I would show you over here, and it completely supported this concept. Now, let me show you, by the way, one of those simulations, just to give you a feel that what happens. Imagine, oh, by the way, one thing I forgot to mention. This formula, another interesting thing about this formula is what it doesn't have. This formula does not have any information about this angle of this waveguide. So in other words, the angle could be anything. You can actually bend this waveguide 180 degrees, and that doesn't affect that formula there. And that's actually quite interesting that we'll show it experimentally later. So imagine that you have a waveguide like this, and then what you do, you basically create this huge you know, geometrical abruption over here. Obviously, you know if the wave is coming over here, you're going to have a good reflection, obviously. And that's indeed the case. So take a look at this simulation of the wave coming like this. And this is filled with air with the, with the conductor around it. And obviously, you get a complete uh, I mean, uh, standing wave. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to come and put a material over here. And then we're going to change the permittivity of that material and bring it smaller and smaller and smaller. So for example, if I put permittivity 0.5, relative permittivity, I mean, you notice still a good amount of reflection happens. But there's a little bit of leakage that happens over here. Now, if you make epsilon 0.1, you notice good amount actually tunnels through. And if you make it very small, all of it will go through. This is quite interesting. Yes, Charles? Under certain conditions, there'd be a bound state of the electromagnetic field in that way, right? Would there not? Uh, when you say bound state, you mean? I mean, a, 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 a wave that oscillates within that ca cavity that decays evanescent. I see. That's very interesting. In fact, you're going to see when I show you the field distribution over here, you see the field distribution over here consists of many modes. And except with one mode, the, all, most of them are actually coupled at that point. In fact, that's one of the reasons the pointing vector actually turns around and goes through that narrow channels. The original mode that's coming is TEM mode over here. And you will see. So here you notice, by the way, Two case, two extreme cases. One, when there is no material over here and just air. And the other one, when you put that material with permittivity. Remember that that material, oh, let me just show you over here. It's only this U shape over here. The rest is air. It's just that region there. So three messages, take home message we take from the comparison of this one. Number one, you actually have no reflection over here. Everything just squeeze through this channel, go to the other side. Number two, electric field is very strong in that channel. It should be because magnetic field is uniform there, but electric field has to increase because pointing vector has to increase in order to integral be the same conservation of uh, power. And you notice, by the way, the phase is uniform over here. And that's an indication of index being near zero there. Now, what good does it do? But before I do that, you may ask, OK, this is interesting, but do we have a materials that can do this? One interesting explanation, by the way, let me show you before I get to the material is this one. That if I want this being no 
reflection, I can take a look at this and I look at the impedance matching from electrical engineering concept there. So that means what? That means if I want to look at this and I look at the impedance of this waveguide, the impedance of this waveguide is a ratio of voltage between top and bottom divided by the current in this metallic wall. And that would be V over I, which I can write it in terms of electric field multiplied by height, magnetic field multiplied by width. And that means I can write it in this form. And eventually it comes to this structure. So take a look at this. Now, these are three waveguides over here, one here, one in the middle, one here. If I match every two of them together, like for example, the first one and second one, that means I have to do like this. Now you can actually see the reason for that. Because if epsilon two is very small, in order for this side to be equal to that side, H2 should be very small. So that means I have to bring the height down when I make the epsilon two. And that's exactly what happens over here. Now you might say, okay, this is interesting. What if I do the opposite? What if, what if I do if I make a material with mu2 near zero? Then in that case, I have to make H2 very hot. And we have done that too, by the way. And that also works as well there. Okay, so what are these materials? There are actually several good examples of that. If in the near IR, you can look at transparent conducting oxide, indium tin oxide, aluminum doped zinc oxide, gallium doped zinc oxide, you notice that if you look at the, around the wavelength of 1.20, 1.19, they have a zero crossing of a real part of permittivity. Of course, the imaginary part is not zero and we would like the imaginary part to be very small. So for some application, these materials are good and some other ones not necessarily. But if you go to mid IR, it seems even better. Silicon carbide at around 10.3 micron had the real part of permittivity zero. The imaginary part could be very small, could be 0.03. These are very good material as E and Z material. If you go to the uh, UV regime, uh, my friend Nikolai Gelude from University of Southampton studied some of the topological insulators. And you notice they become E and Z around 200 nanometer wavelength. But you may say, okay, these are the quote unquote natural or available material at particular wavelengths. How about if I have my own E and Z material at the wavelength I want? So then you use the concept of metal material and you can design them by combination of epsilon positive, epsilon negative materials together. And if you are working in microwave, you can actually imitate some of the E and Z properties by using actually rectangular waveguide, the standard rectangular microwave waveguide that my friend Steve has in his lab. And you operate it at the TE10 mode at the cutoff. And that actually behaves as E and Z material as we experimentally have shown as well. If you want to do it in the visible domain, CT Chen from uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology showed that you can actually design a photonic crystal with the Dirac dispersion, with the accidental degeneracy, that would give you the effective index near zero. And Eric Mazur from Harvard actually brought that idea into integrated photonics and said, you can actually do that. So there are interesting platforms of this E and Z structure you can have. So we experiment two years after we came up with this theory in 2006, we experimentally verified that in my lab using the microwave setup that you see there. And this microwave setup that you see there uh, you can actually create a waveguide at cutoff that you see over here and the two other waveguides input output. What you see over here is the magnitude and phase of the transmission coefficient of this. You notice, by the way, that in this setup, we design it such that you can actually change the length of that transition region. And as you change, you notice that this coupling, this super coupling does not change. This is an indication that this is not a standard fabry perot effect. You notice that there are other peaks of transmission that you see over here. Those are the fabry perot peaks. But the first one is the E and Z supercoupling peaks. That's what the name we gave it to this. And you notice, by the way, the magnitude is consistent with our theory. But more interestingly, also the phase. The phase of the transmission coefficient is zero. And that's an indication that index is near zero there in that structure. So. It's interesting, by the way, that also you can do it with any bend you want. So we had other set of experiment, 180 degrees bent that we have over here. We have 90 degrees bent over here. So essentially you can get this waveguide, you can twist it, you can bend it, no reflections. And you have the structures there, you have the, this process of supercoupling. So this actually opened up 
a series of interesting directions, by the way, in the research that the, we have explored and other groups have explored as well. So let me share with you for the rest of the talk, you know, some of these interesting features of this phenomenon. So one of the things, by the way, that really uh, attracted our attention at that time when we did that, it's, it's very interesting. I can send the wave over here. It can go through the very narrow channel with no reflection, with any arbitrary length, with any arbitrary angle. And I can have a strong electric field there. What good can I do with that? Well, whenever you have a strong electric field, you think about nonlinearity, you think about sensing. But we also talked about another thing. We said, okay, if I have a wave sending over here and I have a very high field there, by reciprocity, if I put a emitter there, it should radiate very well. So we did the study of concept of antennas putting at that point, and indeed we showed that this can radiate very well. But I wanted to actually see what I, I can do. I can put really an, an optical antenna there, an excited atom there in order to actually control its spontaneous emission. But then how do I put you know, something like a quantum dot, something like excited atom in this tiny wave guide that I have there? So one of the interesting points is that you notice that there's a high field over here that's happening there. So in one of the talks I was giving on the theory of this, in the coffee break, my good friend, Albert Pullman, who was the director of the Institute of Photonics in Amol in Amsterdam, came to me and said, I have this instrument in my lab that actually can do this thing for you. So we joined forces, by the way. I went to Amsterdam for one week to his lab, and uh, we designed an interesting waveguide that you see there. I'm going to explain what the other one is. You notice that this waveguide is the visible analog of the waveguide that I showed you, the microwave. This is only two micron size over here. And you notice that the rectangular waveguide, there's a silicon dioxide inside, and there's covered with the silver and with the focus ion beam, you cut the two end of it. So essentially is a rectangular waveguide in the visible domain. And we made several of them in Albert's lab with different uh, uh, width. The height of this region is 85 nanometers. Now, Albert Pullman has this cathedral luminescence spectroscop uh, spectroscopic uh, imaging in his lab. What is that? An electron beam is coming down like 30 keV. And this electron beam actually hits the sample. At the location that it hits the sample can emit photons by transition radiation. Now, when the electron beam hits that sample, by the way, on the silver, penetrates through the silver, goes into the dielectric of the waveguide at that point emits. So essentially it becomes like a little optical antenna at the location that you want. Now the size of that beam, the cross section of that has a diameter of about four nanometers. And then you put this sample, by the way, on this stage that you see over here, you can actually move that stage. And at every point that the electron beam hits, you can actually record the photons that you get. So we could actually have a map of photon radiation as a function of position of that electron beam with the resolution of four nanometer, like four nanometer. So let me show you what we did. So this is one of those waveguides, and this is the top view of that, and the electron beam coming normally to this, and then at every point that electron beam hits, we record the photons, and we plot the intensity of re received energy as a function of wavelength. This is what you get. So the vertical axis is the location of the electron beam hitting the waveguide from the top. And the horizontal one is the wavelength. And of course, you see nothing strange over here. It just shows the modal structure inside that wave. But this is for the waveguide with a width of 240 nanometer. Well, we built several of them. So when we actually tested it with the waveguide with 180 nanometer, you get this structure. You notice what happens. You notice that for this case, when the electron beam hits the waveguide, you notice beyond certain wavelength, we don't have radiation anymore. And that's the cutoff of the waveguide. So we hit the cutoff of the waveguide and you notice, by the way, that doesn't matter where you hit that one, uh, the electron beam is all the same, except at the edges, you get you know, more radiation because of the sharp edges that you have there. So this shows that this waveguide also would be a cutoff and represents the ENZ phenomena. It doesn't matter where you put that electron beam there. So we showed this one as well. Albert and I continued our collaboration and we built actually structure with the stack of silver and uh, silicon nitride over there in order to create an ENZ structure. And with interferometry, we indeed showed that that actually have 
zero crossing. Of course, this structure has more loss for some of the application we want. It's not that uh, relevant. Now, one of the other ideas uh, we pursued is the following. <clears throat> we know, by the way, if you have a material with permittivity near zero from Maxwell electrodynamics, vector D should be equal to zero because D is equal to epsilon E. Now, on the other hand, we know from superconductivity that you can have a Meissner effect, which means you can actually levitate the, the magnet. Now, of course, I mean, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Steve Unlike is world expert in superconductivity, and these phenomena have been studied a lot. From the observer sitting outside looking at the superconductivity knows that the vector B is expelled from that structure. So essentially one can interpret that as mu being zero or perfect diamagnetism. So we ask ourselves this question, is there an equivalent of that from the D equal to zero? So in other words, if I have a substrate with epsilon near zero and D is equal to zero, if I put an electric dipole over here, can it levitate? Now, of course, these two phenomena are very different conceptually. I mean, one of them, of course, is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. The other one is a classical one. Magnet is a DC scenario. This one has to be a dynamic dipole, you know, all of those differences. But this actually encourages us to actually study this. So if I have a dipole over here with the frequency omega at which the substrate is E and Z, what happens to that dipole? Can it have actually repulsive force? There. We studied this theoretically, and we came up with this plot over here that shows the height of the dipole with respect to substrate as a function of the real part of permittivity of the substrate. And you notice that the reddish curve shows the repulsive force, and the bluish curve shows the attractive force. So we actually find out results better than what we thought. So not only an epsilon near zero is going to give us repulsive force, but any epsilon between minus one and plus one will do the same. Now, this one for the case that the imaginary part was zero. So we have assuming no loss, but we say, okay, let's introduce loss to be realistic. And when you introduce even this huge amount of loss of 0.8, you notice the phenomenon is still there. Of course, the range of the permittivity will change in order to achieve that, but it's there. Now, this theoretical result, by the way, excited, you know, two of my good friends, uh, Pino Strangi uh, from Case Western Reserve University and Onofrio Morago. And so we collect, we put our efforts together, three groups to see how we can actually experimentally verify that. This work in progress, by the way, we are not there yet, but we have done some very interesting study, by the way, to see what happens if we have a large particle, like a micron size on top of this. Now Onofrio is expert in, in, uh, in uh, 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 optical tweezing. And, uh, and Pino actually built this sample layer by layer using effective permittivity. And we are currently working on that. So this is work in progress. We just submitted a, another theory manuscript to actually study the effect of the size of the particle with respect to the background. So we'll see what happens. If indeed we show experimentally that this can actually help to levitate the particle, this could be quite interesting because if we can levitate this micron size or maybe nano size, uh, particle there, then it would not have any friction and then we can, can move over the substrate. We'll see. Now, another interesting point is that because you can have this very interesting tunneling effect, what would happen if you go and change the value of permittivity slightly in that channel? Then in that case, that would affect the transmission and reflection there, kind of like, you know, E and Z transistor, like a gate and, and source and drain. So we proposed this idea back then to see how we can actually do this as a sensor. And just recently, by the way, in collaboration with two colleagues, uh, uh, Victor Pacheco in, in, in Newcastle University and Miguel Berrete in Spain, uh, experimentally, by the way, this was shown that you can actually detect a very small dielectric within these microwave channels that you have. This just came out, by the way, a couple of months ago. Nonlinearity. So, when we have this very high electric field, naturally that would tell you this would be interesting place for nonlinearity. So uh, back then with the uh, uh, colleague Yuri Kipshar from Australian National University, uh, he sent one of his posts like David Powell to my group. And we did this experiment by the way there to show what would happen if you have a varactor putting inside this E and Z structure and you bias it from outside. So changing the permittivity to see what happens to the structure. Also, another one is that if you actually change the power of the microwave signal that's going through 
to, can you self-tune it? And indeed you can do that. So this shows that this nonlinearity has a very interesting effect at that time, but just recently, several groups, you know, uh, started actually looking at this nonlinearity, particularly in the near IR. And so uh, my friend Bob Boyd shows the large optical nonlinearity in ITO, indium tinoxide. And uh, Vlad Shalayev, Sasha Boltoseva, and Daniela Faccio also they showed that there is an interesting high enhanced nonlinearity in ASIO. And my group, together with uh, Luca Del Negro from Boston University, we also showed the enhanced third harmonic generations that can happen in ITO. Now, so the fact that in this type of structure, the wavelength is stretched caused you to think about some of the interesting phenomena, you know, in optics and in electromagnetics. So we talk about, you know, sensing, we talk about, you know, coupling, supercoupling. But naturally, the next question is that what kind of cavities we can have in this type of structure? After all, if the wavelength is very long, what interesting cavity resonator we can think about? Now, you're all familiar, by the way, with the standard conventional cavity that they teach us you know, in first course in electromagnetics. If I have a regular cavity with a PEC wall and hollow inside, you all know that, of course, the resonant frequency of that cavity depends on the geometry of that. If you change the geometry, resonant cavity will change. It turns out that in this type of structure, you can have a very peculiar cavities. Imagine the following. Imagine that you would have cavity structures that when you change the external shape of it, the resonant frequency of that would not change. Indeed, that's the case, and we have shown this. So essentially, think about this. Imagine that you have a structure like this, a three-dimensional epsilon near zero structure, and you put a dielectric there, and that dielectric core can be any place you want, by the way. And this cavity is an open cavity, so there is no metallic wall on the boundary. It's just open. It turns out that this structure has a very interesting electromagnetic mode. And what I show over here is electric field distribution, which is this plot, and magnetic field distribution of that mode over here. Now, this is a very, very interesting mode, because if you are sitting, by the way, at this E and Z shell, you notice that at every point in this E and Z shell, that mode has the electric field, but there is no companion magnetic field to that. That's actually quite a fascinating thing, because you can actually have a scenario that your electric field is oscillating with time with the frequency omega, but there is no magnetic field associated with that. And that happens, by the way, in this epsilon near zero. One of the interesting features of these cavities, by the way, is the fact that if you actually change the external shape of this, the resonant frequency does not change. Because the resonant frequency is locked to the E and Z frequency of this boundary. So that's what we studied over here. So imagine that you have a cavity number one and you morph the external shape of this cavity and gradually make it the other one, gradually make it the third picture and so on. So you can have any shape you want as long as you don't change the dielectric core inside, but just change the external shape. And this one, you see that the resonant frequency, that red dots that you see on the plot stay the same, but the quality factor would not stay the same. This is one of those very interesting scenarios that you have a cavity structure whose resonant frequency and Q quality factor are not as conventionally coupled together. You can actually have a cavity that you can change the external shape of it in any way you want. Resonant frequency doesn't change, but the quality factor of that changes. And that can be quite useful, by the way, in quantum optics that we said. We experimentally verified that in my lab. So we built three cavities that you see over here. These three cavities, by the way, the shape is completely arbitrary. It's not like there are three specific shapes. We just chose the three arbitrary shapes there, but the cross-sectional areas are the same. That's the condition. And we put a dielectric rod inside. Now you see three rods, but the three rods just shows the three rods location. There's only one rod. For every experiment, we put it in one of these locations. So we did nine experiments over here. This is the cavity we built, and these are the results. All the nine cases have the same resonant frequencies but different cubes there. So this shows that you can actually have a very interesting scenario. We call it flexible cavity. You can change the external shape of the cavity. The resonant frequency doesn't change. This can have an interesting uh, thermal uh, concept attached to it. Now, we all know, by the way, the thermal radiation is incoherent system. You have all these fluctuating currents there that you're coming over here. 
But then we ask ourselves this question, what if these fluctuating currents happen to be in a material with epsilon near zero? What happens when we actually look at the range of the wavelength near the E and Z of that? Because the wavelength is stretched, then that means that these fluctuating system would, would be partially coherent spatially. And if it's partially coherent spatially, that means the radiation that coming from there would be partially coherent, which means you can actually having the directive beam aspect there. So we theoretically studied this. And indeed we showed that it is possible to have a very interesting thermal radiation in a specific direction. So in these three samples that you see on the, on the left of the screen, the cross-sectional areas are all the same, but the shapes are different. So as a result, you notice that the uh, absorption pattern or thermal radiation pattern can be actually engineered by changing the shape of this step. Recently, by the way, very recently, one of my former postdocs, who is now uh, faculty at the University of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain, uh, Dr. Inigo Liberal, came up with a very interesting observation. Notice, by the way, that the, if you look at how the optical flow looks like inside the near zero index, this optical flow resembles what would happen to the ideal fluid in fluid dynamics. In other words, there's no turbulence. So let me show you two interesting examples uh, that we did in the computer simulation. First, take a look at the bottom picture. You have a waveguide coming in and you have a waveguide going out. And this intermediate region is made of simple dielectric. And you, you know, the arrow shows the, uh, the, the direction of the pointing vectors there. Now you notice, by the way, that of course, you will have a scenarios that this pointing vector, it becomes a, you know, a, a, a vertex over here. But if this region is filled with near zero index, you can never have that. In other words, it becomes an ideal fluid. So optical flows in near zero index material resembles optical fluid in fluid dynamics. This analogy, by the way, could be quite interesting uh, on, the, on, the, on the, uh, this comparison. And it can have an interesting you know, uh, uh, the implications. One of the questions we would like to pursue in the future is that could we have a similar thing as a lift? Like in fluid dynamic, you have the lift, you know, for the wing of the airplane. What would happen if you have such a structure in the ENZ structure? Could we have actually electromagnetic lift? I don't know. This is something that we would like to explore. Just a month ago, by the way, we had this very short article in uh, Physics Today in Quick Study explaining this one in uh, non-specialist form. You notice, by the way, here, uh, this is the uh, distribution of the magnetic field in, in the, uh, near zero index. This is the distribution of the pointing vector that you see there. And this, you show how the field, I mean, the flow lines look like. And if you compare that with a regular n equal to one, you see that there are all these, you know, vortices there that happens, whereas in n equal to zero does not happen. One of our collaborators, Professor Yu Li in Tsinghua University, recently just completed a very interesting experimental setup with the microwave that he experimentally verified this concept. The paper is under review. We'll see how that goes. So indeed, this is quite, quite interesting to see. Charles, how much time do I have? Uh, three minutes. Oh, OK, very good. So let me go very quickly over this. Uh, um, one of the things, by the way, that you know uh, uh, made us very curious about these materials is the fact that inside these materials, wavelength is stretched. So we looked at another phenomenon. I don't have time to do the detail of that. Let me just show you, by the way, bits and pieces of that. Uh, can we have an equivalent of electronic doping that happens in semiconductor? Can we have a photonic doping of that in E and Z? Now, electronic doping, of course, you're all very familiar for that, that you put the doped semiconductor there, and that changes the electric and optical properties. So we ask ourselves this question, if we start with the E and Z material, and we put one dielectric rod inside of that, could we actually change the properties completely? And the answer is yes. Indeed, that's a very interesting point. One of the interesting scenarios is that in the, in, inside the E and Z material, if you put epsilon near zero, obviously curl of H is equal to zero. If you look at the case of a polarization with the magnetic field coming out of the screen and electric field in the screen, the TM polarization, then you can actually prove that for this case, magnetic field has to be uniform along this E and Z. 
Now, that has a very interesting consequence. That means that if you come over here and you start with the column of E and Z, arbitrary cross-sectional shape, and put a dielectric rod inside of this anywhere you want, what happens to the scattering of this? Now, so let me, before I, I mean, without going into the detail of that, because I don't have time. If I have the original column, which is a yellow shape there, and I send the wave over here with this TM polarization, you get certain scattering. Now, you come and put a di single dielectric rod there. You put single dielectric rod, obviously you're gonna get different scattering. But for the observer sitting outside, this different scattering is associated with what effective parameter? Would effective epsilon has changed or you would effective mu has changed? You would say, well, obviously epsilon, because I started with epsilon zero, I put a the dielectric there. But actually that's not the case. It turns out by the way, that if you start with epsilon near zero and you put a dielectric rod in it, the regular epsilon, from outside observer, this entire ensemble still has effective permittivity near zero. I can, I can show you the proof of that after the talk, if you're interested. But then if effective epsilon is not changed, what is it that has changed that changes the scattering? Effective mu. This is quite interesting. In other words, we mathematically proved and experimentally showed that if you put a dielectric rod that is non-magnetic, mu is equal to one, inside the E and Z region that is non-magnetic, mu is equal to one, but epsilon is zero. From outside observer, this entire ensemble has its epsilon near zero, but effective mu, not necessarily one. So combination of two non-magnetic material would give you some combination that effective mu is different than one. And that was one of the interesting thing I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the concept of metal material can do, give you a property that each individual does not have. This is the formula we derive. This is the distribution of that we have. And you can actually in that case create any combination of epsilon and mu you want with epsilon zero and mu anything you want. For example, at the beginning I said, 15 years ago, we didn't touch mu equal to zero. Now we can easily do mu equal to zero. You actually design that dielectric rod such that it gives you the effective mu zero. And we have shown this over here. This is epsilon mu near zero with the hypothetical epsilon mu zero. This is actually with the dielectric rod there. And you notice the field outside identical. You can even have an interesting scenario. Let me jump over here. You can actually have effectively perfect magnetic conductor that doesn't exist in nature. You can using this, you can actually create that. Anyway, so let me stop over here. Let me jump. And we did this something by the way in uh, EMZ quantum electrodynamics there. We, uh, some of the concept of super radiance, uh, sub radiance, long range collective stat states of multi-emitters, long range entanglement, cavity QED, all of this can be actually have an interest, interesting effect into these properties. One last item I want to show is what we did with this question of uh, can the epsilon and mu near zero actually engineer vacuum fluctuations? In this theoretical work, we showed that it is possible. And again, I don't have time to go to the detail of that. You can find the detail of that in our paper in PNAS that came out and we showed that indeed in this type of structure, you can actually have a scenario that you can engineer uh, vacuum fluctuations for the structure that's covered by this epsilon and mu near zero. And theoretically we showed that with that, you can actually adjust the Rabi frequency with changing the size of this cavity, but without detuning it. This is one of the very interesting aspects of this. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I want to thank Charles and Alicia and Karthik one more time for the kind invitation. And thanks to all of you here and uh, for the audience in the Zoom for your atten attention and interest uh, in what I'm going I was presenting. And I'd be happy to answer any question. Thank you all very much. Uh, for the silicon dioxide case, you mentioned that the way which you induce the epsilon mu zero condition is by using a EP an electronic beam. Could you please uh, give some details on how those two things are connected? Sure. Uh, the Can question is the question. I'm going to repeat the question. Yes. Yeah. 
the question was that the, in the case of silicon dioxide, I think you're referring to the case that we were using cathedoluminescence right. with the electron beam. Uh, in the case that we use uh, uh, cathedoluminescence with SiO2 covered with the uh, silver, how does that relate to the epsilon near zero? That was your question. I'd be happy to answer it. Let me uh, bring that slide. Oops. Let me do this. Uh, the, the electron beam there has nothing to do with the E and Z. The electron beam there is to actually measure the effect. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, you're referring to this case. Right. Yes. So uh, this one, let me show you. Uh, this is a waveguide that we built in Albert Tolman's lab, and it's about two microns in length, and it's covered with silver. And this range, this inside, in fact, you can see it over here. Uh, <coughs> this this one is silicon dioxide. There now, silicon dioxide by itself is not that crucial. It's just basically the material inside this waveguide. This waveguide has a cutoff frequency for TE10 mode. When you operate at the TE10 mode, at its cutoff, it behaves as epsilon near zero. Now, how do we actually test the cutoff and the mode inside? By exciting the photon when your actual electron beam hits that one. And that's what happens. So when the electron beam is coming from the top and hits on the top surface of this silver, it's going to penetrate through the silver, gets into the inner side of the waveguide. At that point, there is a transition radiation and excites electromagnetic modes there. Now, when it excites electromagnetic modes, it has many, many wavelengths. So when we measure the photons that's coming from here and we plot the intensity as a function of wavelength, you notice at certain wavelengths, you get to the cutoff of that. And that was this picture that I showed. This one. So you see this cut. And you notice, by the way, that that, if you, if you look at the vertical axis, vertical axis is the location of that electron beam. So you notice that location of electron beam doesn't matter. It's going to give you that straight line that you have there, which means it's independent of where you put that electron beam. That is an indication that the wavelength for that mode at that cutoff is stretched. So you can put it anywhere. So at the edges, you have a sharp edges. That's what you have a high intensity. So electron beam is just a tool to measure the modes inside the waveguide and look for the cutoff of the TE10. That's what it is. Thank you. Um, about these resonators with no walls. Yes. So, um, so you, you get rid of the metal in principle. Yeah. Uh, you just have a, a, an envelope that's on your zero material. Yeah. But of course, there's going to be some costs that burden the real part. Sure. And therefore, uh, you know, non zero imaginary part. Do you have an estimate of where yeah. the cost of this would be? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So let me repeat the question. Steve. So uh, the question is about the, the, the cavity, the open cavities with the E and Z with the dielectric core there. Uh, this is open cavity. So how does the loss affect the Q of the system and so on? Thank you for the question, Steve. I'm glad you asked that question because there are a lot of interesting physics actually in that cavity that there was no time to go over that. Now, first of all, let's, let's answer that question in two steps. First, imagine that the loss is absolutely zero. Of course, that's never the case, but let me assume for a moment, just mathematically, the loss is zero. The loss is zero. And then the question is, how can I actually have an electromagnetic mode in a system that's open and does not radiate? That is, of course, is very interesting. It is the photonic version of bond state in the continuum that in electronic people have looked at. Now, the reason this electromagnetic mode in the case of a zero loss does not radiate because in the E and Z region, the electric field, when it comes on the surface, is always normal. Now, because epsilon is zero, vector D is zero, vector D outside is zero, so there is no electric field normal. And because the tangential component of E inside is zero, tangential component of E outside is zero, so electric field does not exist outside, magnetic field does not exist, so it doesn't radiate. So if I have a zero, absolutely zero loss E and Z, 
this cavity can stay there without radiation. Now, but we always have loss, as you said. So if I have loss there, what happens? It deteriorates this balance. So this starts to decay, is exactly what you say. What is the estimate for the Q? I have that result right here. That is the Q you see. Now, in this one that we, uh, we did, we use actually the realistic material of silicon carbide with the epsilon double prime of 0.03. With this structure, you notice that the resonant frequency almost unchanged, by the way, for these four cavities that you see over here. This doesn't work, okay? But look at the blue dots that you have over here and you see the range of the Q that you have there for that. So yes, obviously Q with deteriorates that you have there. And, and this is actually interesting because even though the resonant frequency doesn't change, the Q can change. And that's what actually we also saw in our microwave experiments. Uh, here, let me show you this one. So you notice there are nine curves over here for three different cavities and for each one, three different location of that rod. You notice all of them have the same resonant frequency, but the Q is different. So yes, that is the case. Ah, excellent question. Thank you. You notice, obviously, this is a three dimensional, obviously, it's three dimensional cavities. This cavity we work based on the structure that we use TE10 mode, and the height of the cavity is land over two. So in the op in the empty region of this cavity that you see there, there's a TE10 mode, and that exactly works effectively as ENZ. Now, there was some, uh, some lot of interesting engineering details over here that I don't have time to go over this. You notice, by the way, you notice something interesting, very in detailed. You notice this rod that we put over here, we put tiny metallic wires around it. The tiny metallic wires are very important there. You know why? Because we didn't want to have a TE10 mode to couple into TM10 mode. We wanted the mode to stay entirely at TE10. And in order to do that, you have to make sure that whenever there is a scattering, you have these tiny wires to prevent the coupling from TE10 mode to TM. And that works you know, beautifully there. Yes, so you can actually make ENZ light. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering, since epsilon is uh, close to zero, if we let you have any small time varying perturbation, we, uh, we usually do it as a Taylor expansion and uh, we do that small fraction of the base index. If we have any time varying modulation, will that get amplified? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Avik, for that question. The question is that for the case that epsilon is near zero, if we do the temporal metal material, the other areas of my interest in my group, what would happen if I change the permittivity near that? The short answer is yes, that's the case. But we have to be very careful because when we do the time variation and permittivity, if the permittivity is above one and the resonance of the medium is far away, from the operating frequency of your wave, you can assume that epsilon is dispersionless, approximately. But if you are below one and near zero, you have to take into account the dispersion. I mean, you have to take into account the dispersion in your time varying. And we have done that, by the way, and I'd be happy to talk to you what, uh, later on what effect that it has. We recently published actually a, a paper on that concept, which is very different than this ENZ talk I gave here, is about what happens to Kramer's chronic relation in the linear time varying materials. And we thoroughly studied that. And you see that what happens actually is very, very interesting. In other words, the Kramer's chronic relation is generalized. So you have double sided I mean, frequency uh, conversion. But yes, if you bring it close to zero, if you take into account the dispersion, then you can actually do the time variation. Thank you. Uh, let's offer an opportunity for questions from the online audience. Sure. This is uh, this is Bill Phillips. Um, I'm wondering about the momentum of the um, electromagnetic wave in the near zero index material. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you had an atom in there, would yep. there be recoil? It seems like the momentum is zero. But uh, anyway, so could you talk about that? <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent question. In fact, we have a paper coming uh, up very soon, by the way, in light science and application, thoroughly studied, by the way, this issue of momentum there. And the earlier version of that paper is an archive bill. So you can take a look at it. The short answer is yes, momentum inside of this is zero. As a result, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the Minkowski momentum uh, is zero. And as a result, you will have a very interesting you know, a byproduct of that. For example, uh, the issue of Heisenberg uncertainty principle, Q is zero. So basically, you have no resolution in this type of material because the wavelength is stretched. Uh, Doppler effect is zero inside of that because phase velocity is very high. You know, all those, you know, byproduct of that. The atom recoil, by the way, it has uh, interesting features there. Yes, this is actually uh, something that we recently uh, uh, studied and is coming up, you know, shortly over here. So the short answer is yes, momentum inside is zero. And that has its own interesting, you know, byproduct of this. Of course, assuming the medium is unbounded. But one thing we have to be very careful over here, and thanks again for your question, Bill, is that, uh, it, it's in, even though we call this the near zero index, but there are actually three categories of near zero index material. One is when epsilon is near zero, but mu is not. The other one is when mu is near zero, but epsilon is not. The third one is both of them near zero. Now, taking into account the dispersion, these three would have different dispersion properties. And, uh, and we recently studied that as well to see how the dispersion of these three different structure, all of them being near zero index will affect. Some of those can have an interesting effect in the momentum aspect that you question about it. For example, if you look at the group velocity, if you have an unbounded epsilon near zero with absolutely lossless group velocity is zero, but we will never have unbounded ENZ, that's number one. And we will never have a situation that loss is absolutely zero. Because of those two, actually your group velocity is not zero. And that's what the energy can go from one side to the other as our experiment has shown. And that's just because the structure was finite and, and you have some residual loss there. However, if you assume epsilon is zero and mu is zero, so-called epsilon and mu near zero material, in that case, group velocity doesn't have to be zero, even an unbounded case. Because both of those follow the dispersion that if, if you can calculate, you'll notice that the group velocity doesn't have to be zero for that case. But for E and Z, it is if it is unbounded and it is absolutely lost. Okay, you, you intriguingly said that there were interesting effects due to the recoil. Could you just say a few words about that? <laughs> yes, that's right. Because what happens is, uh, that's a long discussion, by the way. What happens is because the momentum goes as H bar K, and k is zero, so that momentum will be zero. So then uh, what happens is that if you actually have a photon coming out of this, uh, there's no, I mean, actually recoil aspect of that there. If you consider this structure to be finite and the wave is coming from outside, then that's of course is the different story. Because when the wave is coming from outside and then hit the boundary, then depending on the impedance scenario, then the wave may not be able to get into it if it's epsilon near zero. And then there is some reflection if it is unbounded. Now, if it's a finite structure, that's a different story. The wave can get it of that. So uh, I'd be happy to talk to you offline more on this aspect as well. Okay, thanks.